Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand. And today we're over at the studio and atelier of uh, Joellen and Christopher Reinhardt, uh, both very accomplished realist painters. Uh, Joellen has, uh, she's a member of the Historic Copley Society in Boston and has exhibited there and done various demonstrations for their membership. Uh, she's also an adjunct instructor at the Worcester, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And uh, she and Chris have uh, established, co-founded a very interesting school, the New England School of Fine Arts here in Worcester. And it's an atelier style where Chris, uh, where Joellen is teaching the traditional skills and techniques of realistic representational painting and drawing. And Chris is her partner in crime, and he does uh, the website and uh, runs the Tuesday evening uh, drawing open studio yeah. and uh, really organizes and administers right along with her. So they're co-partners here. Um, and also, Chris has a full-time job in biotech, so he's a busy guy. Uh, I wanted to start just by asking you, what is an atelier? How, how is this system different from regular art school? So an atelier, the word just means workshop. And it is a place where you can come and you can study under an artist in their environment. So here I have my own studio that's been carved out and students have the opportunity to see my work as it's progressing. Um, either I have work on the wall or it's a project that I have going. And so it's a much different atmosphere than a conventional art school. You're more like, a, almost like the apprenticeships where the master was showing the beginning drawing and what happens second and they can exactly. watch the, mm -hmm. the process. Now, are you a, a student of this as well? Yeah, I, uh, uh, one of my goals for helping my wife uh, create this school was so that I could be a student in it. And uh, I've taken classes here and there. And not only does my, my wife teaches the bulk of the classes, but the school also has a number of uh, master painters that have taught at the school. They do short courses, which are very nice. And a few have taught full So you courses, bring in guests, artists, guest lecturers mm -hmm. and demonstrators. Right. That, and are, that are, you know, have tapers. specific training in classical techniques. Yeah. And uh, so it's very niche in, in, in That's that. That's nice for you, yeah. too. Yeah. It broadens yeah. your... Well, what's, uh, ne what's neat is oftentimes when we bring in a master painter, um, we'll have other professional painters that hear, oh, this person's coming, I want to sign up because, well, nobody stops learning. That's interesting, you know, you know that, that's true. You're, oh boy, is that true. If you think you know it, you're done. You have, right. it's always, right. it's, a, it's forever. Uh, now you met when you were going to the, uh, to an atelier yourself and uh, uh, Chris was kind of holding down the, uh, the homestead and making a living one. <laughs> so he's been able mm. to benefit as a part-time student. As a part-time student. And that student. was part of your vision, wasn't it? Yeah, one of the advantages of the school here, as opposed to a real strict atelier, is uh, frequently those ateliers are set up uh, nine to five, five days a week. And it's, it's intensive. It's very yeah. intensive training. And most of the students that sign up for those and they're small, they may only be four students at them. Uh, they want to be career painters, that's, how, yeah, that's yeah, their yeah, goal. Yeah. Well, I would have loved that life, but it was not one I was going to go down. And as you said, most people are in that boat where they have to work during the day, they, so this gives them the, the yeah, opportunity. So it's like a nightlife. It's yeah, so so yeah. Joe's bro broken down that program in such a way that allows uh, professionals in other fields sure. to come and learn these techniques. And it really does two things for them. Not only does it make them a better painter in the genre that they're interested in, but also makes them a better collector and art admirer. Because mm -hmm. now Learning they to see, see and, and they can see what's you know, good, you know, why when a critic says this is good, mm -hmm. they can see, oh, I get it too. Tell us a little bit about the uh, Charles Barker. 
and uh, what that system, what the method is that you use that is quite distinctive from uh, regular. Sure. So when I started as a student, we would um, copy these master copies, and they were called referred to as BARG, B U B A R B A R G U E after Charles Barg, um, and these were plates that were. Um, drawings that were copied from statues of antiquity, usually of certain body parts, and these drawings are a wonderful tool to learn from because they have kind of solved all the problems for the artist, and it's a way to train your eye to see. Um, so with these plates, we actually um, will start with the, what is called a block-in, and so there's a whole method to drawing. Um, first the block-in, which is a simplified outline, and then maybe the outline of the shadow shapes, and then rendering and yeah. filling in the shadow shapes and the edges. Now this mm -hmm. particular uh, image shows a one-to-one -one mm -hmm. scale where the, the student can actually measure on mm -hmm. the paper. So it's a nice, easy way to get the, the idea of relating sizes and directions because you can actually measure right on the plate it, and draw. It's a very logical way to approaching to approach drawing and also this way of measuring if you're a realist you have to at first use some type of measuring and this type of measuring is called sight size and sight size normally is a one-to-one -one ratio mm -hmm. of what you are, mm -hmm. are seeing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I see you work a lot from uh, casts mm -hmm. and of course when you start uh, working from a cast you're working from a three-dimensional object mm -hmm. and you have to translate it into the two dimensions. Mm -hmm. So much... That is, there's a whole progression, and so that is correct, and we start with bar drawings, which is copying something that is 2D to 2D, and then you put in a cast, and a cast is then, you're copying something that's 3D. The whole idea is you're going to actually progress into something that may be like figure drawing and... A logical uh, uh, progression exactly. of... Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And cast drawing has been used for hundreds and hundreds of years. Many of the old masters spent many, many years before you were even allowed to look at a figure. And of course, you had to. The cast is cast. white, and so you're not distracted by color. You're not distracted. You can really mm -hmm. analyze all of those. Uh, and, and again, it's a lo very logical progression. We start with graphite, a very small value scale. We then go to charcoal. We are stretching the value scale, a little bit of a harder medium to use. We then have gray paper and charcoal with white chalk. We're slowly progressing towards painting. Um, so, so the brain yeah. really absorbs exactly. all those nuances. Mm -hmm. Now this is a uh, cast drawing of yours, is it not? It is. Did it's you say that was a student Venus. drawing? That you no, that's, no, that's mine. And that no, I meant took a, me, when you were a oh, student. Oh, when I was a student, yeah. that's correct. And that cast took me months to, really? to put together. Um, I had to have every little hair correct. And yeah. Right position, sure. so just the whole block in took a while, and that's that's the whole point of it is learning to see and let your hand make what you see. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and uh, so after the casts, you uh, then students begin to use color and. That is correct. So after after you get through the cast, then we will start with a simple um, either. Um, still life or figure or portrait depending upon kind of what um, route you're taking. A lot of students like to do barg and cast drawing hand in hand with figure drawing. Um, so they're working the both simultaneously, yeah, do but you, that is the progression. Do mm -hmm. you ever do the quick croaky drawings? Or is that not in your method? Like a little gesture drawing? We, is that what we you used mean? to I'm do sorry. hours of croquis where you get the gesture and the proportion and that's it, mm. and then you move to the next one. Um, no, usually the way that um, figure drawing would be taught would be with one long pose, and one that's what we pose. would use. We would use a plumb line, and you could think about a plumb line as maybe finding that center line of gravity, and then you can see how the figure pushes to the right or left of it with yeah. that you know, the nice axis position. of the figure exactly. goes to the center heel. And, so, and that helps you yeah. to capture the gesture. But yes, sometimes yes. people do get stuck with that. And if they do get stuck, they could probably do one little gesture drawing to yeah. the side. The other thing that's very interesting about their method is that they, when you mentioned Plumbob, boy, I remember those. 
and the dividers and they use, tell us about the way the string is used. Well, in bark drawing um, and when we progress and into life figure drawing, drawing yeah. life drawing, the way I was taught, and don't even ask me why, but I was taught with a string and that was it. So we would have a plum, so it's a string with a weight on the bottom, and we could stretch it out horizontally, we can hang it vertically, so we would use or that you, alone as a measuring Or you recognize that tool. the angle is not quite straight. When you drop the plumb bob, you can see the rel relative angle. Exactly. The, uh, and, and that's a good an point. Edge. I had yeah. mentioned sight size as a way of measuring, but there's also something called relational measuring. And really easy, it's just what yeah. points fall on a line, whether yeah. it's a vertical line or a horizontal yeah. line. It's kind of, in this training, it's kind of like when students start off and they have that grid, you know, yes. where they're copying. I, I start at never, the middle and grow yeah, out. <laughs> I have never liked that grid because I always it's feel a good you, can, placement. you can it's go off with it. Placement. But this yeah. is training you to have kind of a mental grid. Yeah. So. But the mm -hmm. simple idea of the string is mm -hmm. that I can say, his leg is this long. But on my drawing, I can say the mm -hmm. leg is the same size as the mm. torso, or the head is the same width as the right. thigh, or whatever it is. Right. So it's proportional uh, mm -hmm. seeing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And Very I, good. And I also, what I like about the program, too, is it's, it's almost like managing your frustration to a certain extent, is that when you're doing the BARG, it's 2D onto 2D, and all the hard work is done for you. It's all about measuring. A lot of then, people copy black right. and white photographs for the same reason. Right, right, right. So, so when you go to the cast, now there's an added frustration there that the artist has to manage. He has is to. They can't move. The artist has to be very careful about how they move because when you have a two dimensional. A, a three-dimensional object in front of you that you're copying. You move two inches this way, everything's different. Everything's changing. And then when you go to... Uh, That's called a, perspective. One point of right. vision. And then when you move to the figure or the portrait, now the subject matter can move. So you have to sort of manage those problems. So, so if you can nail measuring down yes. before you yes. go to, yes. you know, a moving model, yes. you know, you're much better yes. off, yes. you know. So uh, it's really a very systematic system yeah. mm -hmm. and very productive. I always thought that it was true and I was, my teachers always said to me, you can teach anybody to draw because mm -hmm. it's a system, it's a way it of learning to look. Mm -hmm. So these exercises are like learning the scales on the piano. You learn how, or mm -hmm. learning to read and write, and then you can compose with words. And mm -hmm. so uh, it's a very systematic approach that works. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the tricky part is, you can. We, we were laughing about this before the show, but the tricky part is you can learn how to draw and paint. That's the easy part. The hard part is knowing what to draw and paint. So that's, that's, that's a whole true. other yeah. argument. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. a whole right. other Absolutely. argument. So show us some of your other uh, examples here. Sure. These are portraits? That, um, uh, these are portraits, and I did these right after I finished up as a student. And I would have a live model come into my studio, and I would pose them in a direct light source, and I would get out just a very simple palette. So for example, this painting might have four to five colors only, and I would learn to mix, which is very important, learn to get a full range. Um, I would mix my skin tones out of just three simple colors, and um, it was just a great way of learning. And yeah. again, I would use that sight size method of drawing. Um, mm -hmm. This is the same thing, it's a model that um, I hired who came in and posed from life, and again, very simple palette. Um, mm -hmm. And I just enjoy the whole process. Mm. For me, it's just a wonderful uh, challenge mm -hmm. uh, just to capture somebody and to have a vision. I mean, sometimes so is I think- capturing somebody, is that the main goal of portrait painting, would you say? Well, everybody probably has their own goal. For me, it's trying to find that beauty and a language in a way to pull out of that person and show on your canvas. And who yeah. they are. Yeah. I, I, I know you do professional commissions mm -hmm. too. Who is this? 
So this is Chief Justice Martha Grace, and I was very honored to get this commission. She is the first female Chief Justice to have her portrait done hanging over in the Worcester Courthouse, and I was just very happy to be chosen um, to paint Good her job. portrait. She's Good job. just a lovely person. Um, this is Cliff Wilson, who's a framer in the city, and Again, I just love thinking about how to develop the features, the head, how the lights kind of flow through all the way. There's a beautiful diagonal going on, and yeah. I like. And yet, a there's a wonderful stability about mm -hmm. him. He has that weight, and you know, we were talking, Chris, about um, how a portrait can, you know, like how does a portrait or a still life express anything? Is right. it always a story? Does it have to be a story? If there's, you know, how does the painting communicate? You look at a painting like this and subtle things like his stability, the way he right. sits in the chair, the way he has a casual pose, the way mm -hmm. all those things tell about him, or uh, even the tones of gray, and he's kind of low, not overstated, it, you know, all those subtle yes. structural and color, they all tell me who this person is. Yes, yes, and I think that that's what often separates a photograph from a portrait, is that the artist has a little bit more license and can play with those emotions. Well, has more emotions. leeway to yes. move mm -hmm. things around if they want, but, uh, but the photograph, of course, a good photograph. Oh, can do the same it thing. Sees, it can do, they can make it see what it want, needs yes, to see. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, but with portraiture, that's the one thing that I really like, is yeah. that a good yeah. portrait really is more than just a, yeah. an image. And you were saying, too, that learning to do, like I always thought that the figure and the portrait were the most difficult because you know, when you're painting a tree, if you put an extra foot on mm -hmm. the branch, it's okay. But if you put an extra foot on the nose, it's, you know, <laughs> right, right. it doesn't work. So the, the figure and the portrait are really, really difficult. But um, on the other hand, it's the, it's the distinctive touch and mm -hmm. maybe the little distortions that the mm -hmm. artist vision puts in yes. that makes it your new unique statement. You exactly, know? exactly. I mean, every, it, uh, painting shouldn't just be a copy of a photograph, and an artist should be able to take and interpret that. A lot of my students, I'll give them a photograph, and they'll always make some comment like, maybe I'm crazy. What does she see in this? This is a terrible photograph. And I teach through demonstration. I think that's the best way for students to learn. And by the time I'm done manipulating it, they'll realize what my vision was when I saw that, why and I picked it. And how you relate mm -hmm. all those visual mm -hmm. elements. I can add yeah. one thing. One of the, uh, where Joe really does shine is she's done a number of uh, posthumous portraits where the sitter passed away. And usually what she's given is a fistful of really bad photographs. And she doesn't pick one and copy it. She takes those a Ten, compilation. Compilation and puts them together. That's tough. And 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 so people are now smiling. They're sitting in a yeah. nice position and so forth. And she'll work with the patron yeah. and then finally get to the end product. And in the end, yeah. it's really interesting because it is. It's just so rewarding because you give somebody this work and it just really touches them in yeah. such a positive yeah. way. Sure. And so for me, it's it's rewarding right. and. Now, here's a portrait of a dog, which I absolutely love. I, this was one of the first things I saw of yours over at this Brickler factory. Mm -hmm. And there's something about this, uh, the way you've just, again, who would think to use those stripes? Mm -hmm. Or uh, the whole expression of the dog, the placement of the dog in the mm -hmm. crack of the cushions, you know, the whole, it, it all works together to make a very expressive statement, I think. Uh, is this your dog? And it is a dog. Yeah. So she is a rescue dog that we got from the Animal Rescue League. And um, I always say she's my biggest model next to my daughter. Um, and I probably have more pictures of my dog than 
um, than of our daughter. Uh, and when I look at this, I just love the stuffing coming out of the Duncan Fife couch. And I always think, oh, the cat framed the dog in this one. So there is a um, story here. And there is. It there tells are a little many bit of a story. stories mm -hmm. in this painting, yes. which you. So it becomes a little bit more narrative, rather. Yeah. And and it's also personal because the couch itself has meaning to me. The dog yeah. obviously has some meaning to me. So um, I was I thinking, thinking that it has kind of a surreal quality in the way you look over that back of the couch and it's almost mm -hmm. like the horizon mm -hmm. and you go off into the desert or yeah. something, you know, yeah. above above the dog. And then the couch is kind of like a, a tent, you know, yeah. one of those Arab tents. And it's something. also, it's a very limited palette. So again, we're talking maybe five tubes but of paint. But the color is order, luminous. And, uh, you're, you're both the good colors colorists. All, and this all is a big painting. Together. This is, yeah, it very doesn't large. show here. This is a very large mm -hmm. painting. Uh, mm -hmm. And that must have yeah. an impact too. Uh, and then you do uh, still life and what? I started as a still life painter, and for some reason, I just always gravitate towards still lifes. If I go into a museum, I run up to the still life or the portrait, and, and they have really always been my favorite. Uh, you know, it's funny, but uh, there are paintings in the Worcester Art Museum that I, uh, you know, you look at a Chardin or something, and it's so peaceful and so... Mm -hmm organized and so set and so stable and I love some of those mm. and the grays are so beautiful mm -hmm. and this is a beautiful study in oh, uh, very, pale, gray, very pale gray gray tones gray with just a little bit of color to pop but it's and... full of luminosity mm -hmm. it's like you can see the light coming right through those cups and I do collect a lot of antiques, so I will shop around, and I have a whole collection here. So I love having linen tablecloths. I love painting white fabric is one of my favorites, um, just to kind of get that into the foreground. I love painting teacups or any types of form. Fruit is very hard to paint. Lemons turn fast, and poor Chris that had to lemon, live with a lot of That fruit, lemon fruit makes my mouth water. <laughs> yeah. you know, that one. Yeah, it's easier to... <laughs> Paint them when they're not sliced. But you know, the hard part about <laughs> painting is, as opposed to the black and white, black and white is kind of easy because you're just relating one thing, tone. Mm -hmm. But when you go with color, it, it's all much more mm -hmm. difficult. And to have all the colors feel like they're in the same light yes. and in the same environment and they have to influence right. each other and right. be harmonious. And, and I'm very, very organized with my palette. So if you were to see me paint in oils, um, I have all my colors laid out and I do pre-mix a scale huh. of values of each color. So God, that I'm kind the of keeps me. <laughs> 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 I'm like hacking no. away for a no. week until the color starts to you know, be I think right. When you go through this training with bar drawing, you learn to be so precise that yeah. when you graduate to oil painting, you still have those habits. Yeah. And this is another painting that has just some linen in it, some antiques, and trying to create a little bit of atmosphere going on in the, the back. Glass and, and I silver. love yeah. glass and I love painting. Glass silver. and silver are oh, really I good for all. reflecting uh, temperatures mm -hmm. and, and images in the surfaces. Mm -hmm. And the persimmons, these are lovely. Thank you. So uh, is still life a major genre for you, or do you uh -huh. more to the portrait? I, I love them all. So um, I even love landscape, and I don't have any landscape here. And I teach a lot of plein air landscape uh -huh. as well. Um, I, it's like trying to pick your favorite child. Right? Yeah, I yeah, just yeah. love it. I and, lo I love it and now all. this is a different medium for you. If you want to hear a funny story, um, you were my first watercolor <laughs> instructor. You know, way, way, I had way forgotten back that. When, and, uh, probably 30 years ago. I hate to say that. Yeah. And, um, and I just love watercolor. So I call watercolor my fun medium. It I is can, fun. You can just let the water kind of react and yeah. do its own thing with the pigment. Yeah. So I It's a great include... teaching medium too yeah. because it's quick. I remember yeah. having students in oil painting classes where they would have a really bad composition or a bad something mm -hmm. and they would be pounding on it for like weeks and I just wish them to make a new start, whereas with mm -hmm. the watercolor painting, you, you know, you mm -hmm. kind of finish the painting in one day at least. It is, and it's very portable. Yeah. It, this it's, is beautiful oh, with the way you've you. used those, the light and the deep. Oh, and I also like the freshness of the composition, the way the girl is not the center. Mm -hmm. the right, way you're, right. And even the way his hairs and her hairs, you know, it's kind mm -hmm. of nice. I like that. So Thank you. how much watercolor do you do? 
I just, teach a lot of watercolor, you, probably equal amount with other students and watercolor. Yeah, and, now here's a and, landscape, we're very, uh, has a brilliant, dazzling sun about it. Mm. Uh-huh. And oh, here's a beauty. What's this? Uh, so pastel? this is pastel. Um, I dabble in pastel. This was done in our Tuesday evening mm -hmm. drawing program from a live model. And I just love layering the colors and you get just a beautiful glow and luminosity yeah. in, with pastels. Nice. Love that neckline. And um, so now this is your painting, Chris. Yeah, that's, yes, that's uh, one of mine. That's uh, lemons. Obviously. <laughs> At least I hope obviously. You know what? There's something very expressive about the starkness of the composition that Thank I like you. a well, lot. I like the sitting on the shelf and uh, the one important thing is, you know, when you're doing it from life is that you're not necessarily married to everything you see. So the background is largely made up because yeah. it was at the sprinkler factory and uh, the background wasn't that nice. So I played around, <laughs> and the background must have changed four or five times. Sure, you're discovering yeah. the form that you want. Yeah, and I'm a... But it's, think about it, it could be an abstraction of two circles and yeah. five stripes, you know, yes. or just variations of rhythm. And that's and, a small painting. Yeah. And then this is a, uh, uh, now this is a portrait. Um, and that's your portrait of Joellen? No, that's my portrait of my daughter. Ah! And she does look like, a little bit like She her. certainly yeah. does. And, you know, that when you talk about having a story behind a portrait, um, she's holding a bunny, and it's sort of an homage to my favorite painting uh, is Da Vinci's Woman with the Ermine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was going for here. And Joe's wear, um, Arden is wearing Joe's black pearls that I gave her uh, when she turned 50. So it has 50. a lot of sentimentality. Yeah, and the bunny was, it, the bunny's old even in this painting, and the bunny's still alive. But when Arden was a very little girl, she wanted this bunny, and uh, I didn't want to get it for so her. So it's really a family treasure yeah. at this point. And this is your figure drawing? And that's just a figure drawing. Pencil? Done. It's in pencil. Lovely, uh, Just lovely. a quickie, uh, yeah. three-hour study. Very lovely. So um, I wanted to ask you where your work can be seen, uh, aside from here in the studio. Well, my work in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody uh, come on. Both of yeah, you, yeah. though. Your well, work well, Joe, is... Joe's uh, is, is collected pretty well. Tell uh, us you... a, just a couple. Tell mm. us your website. I just sure. want to close no, up my, here. My website is um, joellenreinhardt.com. You can also find both Chris and I through our school site, which is nesfa-worcester.com. Um, and under faculty, you can find links to both of us. I also have work down in Chatham at Gallery Antonia, up in Kenny Bunkport, at the Copley Society. So and, you're all over the place, uh, kid. I am. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. And um, we want to invite you to take a look at their website. And uh, maybe you even look up the uh, bar drawing method uh, and see what that's all about, because you might be interested in doing something a little more scientific in your approach. Uh, but it's been great for me to learn about your techniques and your uh, processes here and I'm so glad you're in the Worcester area offering this. Thank so, you. Uh, yes. Thanks Thank for you. being here and um, we hope to see you again next time for another edition of Arts and Ideas. Mm -hmm.